I'm Jonathan Stark, and this is Inside the Brackets. Today, our premiere show is HTML5, Why I Oughta. And with that, let's introduce our guests. First, I have Brian LaRue, Product Manager of PhoneGap and TopCoat at Adobe. Michael Rasselan, Director of Research at Evans Data. And Mike Richmond, an architect from Intel's Open Source Technology Center. Thanks to each of you for being here today. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. So, I'd like to start with a fundamental question for Mike. Why should the computing industry care about HTML5? Well, what's happening now is that HTML5 is breaking out of the confines of the web and the browser, and it's being used to build actual applications. So that makes it a topic of interest to a, the entire software development community and to people planning applications and application strategies. Mm, excellent. Why does Intel specifically care about HTML5? It's a chip maker, right? Intel cares about HTML5 because we care about software development productivity. If you can't get new experiences, you're not going to buy a new device, and of course we care about you buying new devices. Right. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Great. Well, thanks for that. So, Brian, um, you're at Adobe. I'm at Adobe. Didn't Adobe used to make something called Flash and Flex and... Whoa. Uh, yeah, we still do. Uh, Adobe uh, makes all kinds of software. Uh, Flash and Flex are uh, our answer to building more high-performance applications for mobile, uh, more structured applications and apps for people that still write ActionScript. Um, but Adobe today is definitely more focused on HTML and HTML5 especially, um, and uh, PhoneGap for building mobile applications. We're seeing more and more people embrace web and web technologies for uh, different um, deployment targets besides the, just the web browser. We're, like Mike mentioned, we're seeing it hit uh, mobile apps, and uh, Adobe wants to be a part of that publishing process for creatives. So, Michael, what does uh, your research show about HTML5 adoption among developers? I think right now about half of all developers in the world are using HTML5 in their development in some capacity. That's about 8.6 million developers. Uh -huh. If you look at those who are just planning to do so, uh, that's about 28%. And if you look at just a subset who are working on mobile, 60% of them are using HTML5 in some part of their development work. I've heard different like numbers thrown around. I have no idea. Like, I don't know how you could actually quantify or count. Like. It seems like there's so many different kinds of content creators now that it's it's tricky. Like crusty old dude who writes you know J2E apps is probably building HTML apps and he's probably considered a developer. But the 16 year old kid that picked up uh, Dreamweaver was he a developer? Yeah. Since HTML5 has become uh, more widespread in use, uh, there 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 are fewer uh, barriers, there are fewer obstacles, uh, and I think that the de the definition of what a developer is has been. Uh, dynamic and ha it is expanding. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. So you mentioned that um, uh, half and, and up to 60% on mobile are using HTML5, but what about the people who aren't using HTML5? Do you have any numbers on that? The percentage who, of the developer population who don't use HTML5 has been around 20%. Um, and it's been constant. Do you know what kind of development they do? Is it like just server-side stuff where it doesn't apply? Or It's actually a pretty diverse group. Uh, I mean, we've seen that uh, among the people who don't have any plans for HTML5, uh, they're more involved in things like uh, OEM uh, uh, application development. Many of them are involved in, in um, scientific and technical software. We still see some bit of the enterprise segment still uh, not embracing HTML5. Mike, it's clear that there's a lot of momentum uh, behind HTML5. What do you think uh, are the aspects of HTML5 that make it attractive to developers? Well, it's a, it, it's a higher level of abstraction uh, than traditional native programming, just the same way that traditional native programming uh, in a language like C that we now call traditional was once the disruptor and assembly language programming was what people did. The facilities that uh, the browser or web runtime offers are such that they relieve the programmer of taking care of details like um, memory allocation or garbage collection. The people that are writing these web engines are some of the best native programmers in the world mm -hmm. and they do a great job of uh, taking the elements of HTML5 using CSS and laying things out on the screen in a very, very efficient way. 
What would you say uh, are the main challenges facing an HTML5 developer today? By far and away, right now, the biggest problem that we're seeing is performance. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear about it all the time, HTML5 slow, or web apps are slow, or JavaScript slow. And it's a tricky conversation because slow compared to what is, is the first question you have to ask. Right. If we're not benchmarking, then we don't know. Is right. it too slow to do your job? Probably not. And we're finding that while JavaScript is arguably definitely always going to be slower than the native equivalents, um, there's a lot of exciting technology coming out slowly, but soon to allow more parallelism, to allow uh, code to be compiled using things like ASM.js to get native speeds. And we're not seeing any problems there, but we are seeing problems with the DOM. Mm -hmm. and the, do the document object model is, is what is the guts of, of an HTML page. And when you manipulate that DOM, you cause what's called a layout or a reflow. When you reflow the content, you can get jank. And jank is the, it's in the dictionary. I actually looked this up a little while ago. <laughs> right. like, people are saying janky all the time. And I'm like, is that even a word? Like, so it is, anyways. Um, so <laughs> you, you see this jankiness, and, and it's, it's from the DOM. It's from interacting and touching the DOM. Because what happens when you, when you interact with the doc, document object model, you have to repaint this whole page. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's where we typically will see the browser will lock up, because it's single threaded. User interaction uh, you know, is then blocked, and it, it feels janky. Right. So we're doing a lot of studying and thinking about how we can fix this. And it's a lot more about practices and um, education than it is about actual problems with the web browser itself. Most of these cases, uh, we can find that just writing good CSS is a part of the problem. Um, and teaching developers how to write good CSS is something that we're trying to address in a new project at Adobe called Topcoat. I think the one of the big performance challenges for HTML5 isn't that my app is slow. It's my app is slow, and I don't know why. Yeah. And, it, and it turns out that yeah. being able to help developers figure out what it is they've done that has, is slowing things down is probably the biggest area for improvement that I see. So instrumentation. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also developers that are doing things uh, by hand, yeah. uh, coding to the spec, when they actually ought to be using a library that mm -hmm. has basically solved all these problems for them. That's really the key to productivity. The big benefit of a library, especially an open source one, is they get battle tested. And they get right. exposure to all these weird Android phones that nobody has except for people in China, right. apparently. Mm. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the least appreciated aspects of what's happening with HTML5 and JavaScript is the interaction with open source to create mm. these tools and libraries that increase the productivity of the community at large. Yep. And so it doesn't matter if there are differences between IE and Chrome and Firefox if you're using a library like jQuery or something like Topcoat where you know, professionals are burning the midnight oil to make yeah. sure that all those things are tested uh, on all the devices. And so as a developer, you just use one of those and you know, the problem of uh, cross-platform uh, compatibility and performance is essentially solved for you. We're seeing a new collaborative browser war where everyone's working together in the HTML5 spec and other specs at W3C to create a compatible surface. There's one part of that surface that isn't compatible, and that's DevTools. And so if you shift between Chrome and Firefox and IE, you have completely developer tool specific experiences. And so the interesting thing to me is a lot of these dev tools are building up around kind of classical software ideas. So we've got ideas around performance. Oh, I want to get into benchmarking mode. I'm going to do some performance analysis. So I'll put on my performance hat. And that's what a game developer would do. He'd build the app really quickly, and then they'd be like, oh, god, this thing is slow. Let's, let's do some benchmarking and optimize speed this it. thing up and optimize it. Web developers don't do that. They, they just ignore that part of the problem. Web developers are like, I'm building an app. This looks pretty sweet on my browser. Deploy. And we need to find a way to get these tools to work together to standardize so that we can have a consistent surface for the development experience as well as the display experience. And we also need to think about how developers work. Web developers don't put on their performance optimizing hat because they may or may not know that they even do that as a part of their job. What are developers saying are giving a really hard time with HTML5? In general, developers are saying that, that it's hard to debug. It's hard to test for, uh, for multiple devices. Developers who want to deploy their apps to app stores sometimes have a hard time submitting their apps. So there's a submission problem as well. So does that tie into monetization? That's a bigger problem. I don't know. Ask eBay or Google <laughs> or Amazon. Like, the web is very monetizable. If you create value, with, you know, which you can do pretty easily with the distribution of the web, you can turn that into money at some point. Um, <laughs> 
It seems simplistic, but it's true. One of the challenges for uh, development using HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript for apps mm -hmm. has been the fact that up until a couple of years ago, the standards were really oriented towards websites and web browsers. Mm -hmm. There was there a kind of a cognitive breakthrough a couple of years ago where they said, you know, there's a difference between a web browser and a runtime that's part of a mobile platform or part of something like Windows 8 Modern, mm -hmm. where you can have access to all those things because you're not also in that same piece of software going to be having history and cookies. And so once the W3C realized that that distinction was important, they established a system application working group, brought together people from companies like Intel and from uh, the Mozilla project, you know, because you've got sort of ties in, you've got uh, Firefox OS, both of which are focused on these kinds of applications for devices, and that's where these APIs are being worked on, and that's why you see now uh, a potential really acceleration of application development. Mm -hmm. And then you have PhoneGap and the Cordova project, which is essentially bringing those kinds of APIs to the installed base mm -hmm. of Android and iOS and you know Blackberry and and so on. Brian, do you think that that some of the you now because of this cognitive break, as you put it. Um, do you think that some of those features will eventually trickle into a standard browser in some form, or do you Most think that? Have, or many of have. Um, so device APIs have worked their way into the browser pretty consistently and are, are getting good traction. We see uh, camera access through the Media Capture API today, which allows you to declaratively invoke a camera application, which means a user clicks something and says, yes, I want you to use my camera. So there's a permission mechanism there or an opt-in. We see uh, device orientation, device motion, uh, so we can get access to that. We full screen lock API, WebRTC is just around the corner, which means we get full duplex binary communication, which is video yeah, conferencing crazy. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the, the APIs aren't such a big deal, but the permissioning model that Mike was talking about is definitely a problem. Um, I view PhoneGap as kind of like legacy software nowadays. And this is just like thinking 10 years into the future, but we look at you know, Google Chrome OS, WinJS from Microsoft, Firefox OS from Mozilla, Tizen from Samsung and Intel. Um, that's, that's the future. That's what we're looking at, packaged web applications for sure. I think the key is that um, if you are using web technologies to build apps, you have the opportunity to have those apps run on multiple platforms with less work which should give you time to add value either by doing new cool features in web technologies or perhaps some cool extension to the, uh, to the platform using native code that you incorporate using something like Cordova or PhoneGap mm -hmm. uh, that makes your app stand out and do things that you know, your competition's apps can't do. Mm. So what, I'm wondering, curious, uh, what's Intel been doing to address some of the, the gaps that we've been talking about? We're very active uh, in standards groups to have new APIs for accessing features in the platform. We're uh, very active in performance measurement and instrumentation of web runtimes and browsers and pushing uh, fixes to improve performance uh, upstream and to the open source projects that are behind many of the web browsers and web runtimes like uh, Chrome and uh, uh, Mozilla and Safari. Um, we have a, a very interesting tools product called the Intel XDK that's aimed at uh, developers who may not have used HTML5 before and want to try it. It's kind of an all-in-one all tool. And we have a developer program that's very focused on uh, educating traditional native developers in HTML5 and what it can do for them. I imagine Adobe, being a big tools company, has a whole bunch of things going on in this area. We take like a similar kind of approach or view on um, on the web as, as what you see at Intel, sort of a top down and a bottom up. So in the top down, a high level, we're interacting with the standards groups to see that the long game is is going to work out. Um, a little farther down that stack, we're we're contributing features to Blink, Chromium, and Mozilla as well. We're also <laughs> doing uh, Cordova uh, at Apache, which is yeah. the open source roots for PhoneGap. Mm -hmm. And then all the Edge Tool Suite, we want to, what we want at Adobe is to make it easy for creatives to create content that targets the web. 
Edgeflow is a tool for building responsive websites. Mm. Then there's Brackets, which is a code editor. So we got our fingers in yeah. lots of pies. We're doing all kinds of web stuff. You mentioned responsive tools for responsive design. This is one yeah. of the most exciting areas, I think, of this, uh, this web technology. One of the hardest things to do in any programming environment is to, or, or web environment for that matter, one of the hardest things to do is to have code which works on a small screen and a big screen. The transition from HTML4 to HTML5 brought to the web the ability to separate layout from uh, content and, and design from programming logic. And so you can use CSS media queries to say, hey, how big is the screen? And you can make the layout of the page vary. And you know, the Boston Globe was one of the first sites to really show how uh, that's done. It's still one of the best demos where you go to bostonglobe.com, you take your desktop web browser, you shrink the window, and as you shrink it, it magically, magically yeah. seems to turn into a mobile site. Mm -hmm. To be able to bring that capability to the application world. It's so awesome. That's yeah. unbelievable. That yeah. is so amazing. And what that means is that if you're an application developer, you don't have to worry when, oh look, here's the new tablet that is a big hit with a nine inch screen versus mm -hmm. the thing that was a phone that was a five inch screen. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it turns Watch. into a wearable or it's something. It's going to happen. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and it happen. makes you think more carefully about your fundamental design right up front, mm -hmm. but it pays huge dividends in the end. So Mike, where do you think uh, HTML5 is going? What do, you think, what do you think the sort of future holds for HTML5? Well, I think um, you're going to see more complete device capability being exposed to the JavaScript programmer. So more APIs, um, more uh, ability to actually get inside and see what the device is doing. Mm. I think you're going to see much better performance instrumentation for uh, what, uh, developers that are developing using this technology. I think you're going to see uh, increasing exploitation of parallelism at multiple levels. So Mozilla is working on a technology called Parallel JavaScript that actually lets you ex uh, express algorithms uh, in parallel, the kinds mm. of things that you might have used uh, a math library for, for some complex calculation. But you'll, there'll also be uh, increasing application of parallels, parallelism inside the browsers and web runtimes so that they scale better uh, when you have more cores. All right. Well, we're almost out of time, but I'd love it if each of you could take uh, just in one or two sentences, give us an idea um, why you think a developer should take a web first, HTML5 first approach. We can start with Mike. I think that developers ought to look at HTML5 first for any project because why spend time moving an application from platform to platform by recoding when you can just redeploy it for that new platform? Michael, do you have a feeling? Eventually, we may get to a point where you can't tell whether something is, is a web app or, or uh, an HTML5-based application. I think that we're already there now in certain, certain cases. And Brian? The business drivers are, are good. You know, distribution, skill reuse, that's awesome. But there's another angle to the web that I think is important and should come up once in a while. It's like probably humanity's greatest asset. And um, <laughs> it's something that we can all participate in. The W3C is an open community of people that can drive the standards, and browsers are, for the most part, open source, too, and you can be a part of that. Even just building web content, you're helping contribute to this larger thing. I think that's a worthwhile reason, too. Great. Great stuff, everyone. Thank you very much. Today we've heard about the key benefits of HTML5. We've talked about gaps and how they're being addressed. We've learned about some of the tools available to help developers and got a glimpse of where things are headed in the future. Thanks for watching.